Okay, well, say good morning to everyone. So this is an exciting week with the start of the football season. <laughs> now, I assume all of you are going to the game on Saturday? What's this? I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I hope so. We'll, we'll find out. Who do we play on Saturday? Oh, well, maybe by next class for the pop quiz, you'll know who we play on, who we play on Saturday. Okay. Well, we were talking about ellipsometry at the uh, last class. We have a little bit more to talk about here. Remember, in ellipsometry, what we're doing, basically, we're measuring the state of polarization. And so the state of polarization, what we're really after is the, the ratios of the S and P components of the electric field before reflection off of a sample and after reflection off of a sample. And we're looking at how the phase difference between the S and P component changes as we reflect off of a, of a sample. And the basic schematic here was what's shown here. So we have a source, and then we'll put a filter in. Sometimes people use a lot of different wavelengths for, for the measurement. Um, we'll just use a, a single wavelength today. And um, collimate the light. Polarizer here that we're going to rotate. A compensator there. And we said we put in a compensator, so the uh, I guess it was the slow axis was at 45 degrees from the uh, S&P uh, axes. And uh, we reflect off a sample. And then the output, well, after the sample, we have an analyzer here and a detector. And so the goal is to some way adjust the polarizer here such that, uh, well, when the light is reflected off a sample, the state of polarization has changed. And we're going to uh, put in just the opposite polarization down here by rotating the polarizer and the compensator so that the beam reflected off the sample will be plain polarized. And then we will be able to uh, rotate the analyzer to uh, extinguish the light. And just at the end of class, we said, well, what if we put a compensator here uh, with retardation delta? And in particular, we're going to look at where uh, this is a quarter wave plate. And so if we come down here to look at the result, what happens? We said that as we rotate the polarizer through 180 degrees, the retardation of the light incident upon the sample will change through 360 degrees. And what was really cool, I thought anyway, and something I never would have guessed, is that if the compensator is a quarter wave plate, so 90 degree retardation between S and P, there will be a linear relationship between polarizer angle, P, and retardation. And I mean, that has to be cool. That, it's just uh, amazing that, that it works that way. Come back here. So make this a quarter wave plate, 45 degrees. Rotate the polarizer, and we'll get a linear shift between the S&P components for what's falling on the sample. So we'll rotate this and rotate this and find combinations of polarizer angle and analyzer angles to extinguish the light here. And from that, we're going to calculate the, the delta and the psi that we had above. So we can go through here and uh, look at the amplitude determination for the S&P components. And uh, I'm going to go through it pretty fast here. Uh, just look at the. Uh, basically how you do it. Um, the tangent of uh, L, as we call it, was E sub P over E sub S magnitudes. Uh, we could write then that the tangent squared of L would be, well, we take the um, uh, P component 
here and multiply it by the complex conjugate. And the same thing for the S, multiply that by the complex conjugate. And the uh, S and P components were given up above. I won't go back to it. So that would be tangent L squared. So we can calculate that. Um, generally, we, we look at the cosine of 2L here. And it's kind of neat what happens here. If we use our trig identities here, we can write that the um, 1 minus the tangent of alpha squared over 1 plus the tangent alpha squared is a cosine of 2 alpha. And so the cosine of what we're interested in here is L. So cosine of 2 L will simply be 1 minus uh, tangent L squared over 1 plus tangent L squared. And if you go through the algebra here, that will turn out to be just minus 2 cosine of 2 P uh, cosine of delta. So delta was the retardation of this compensator, um, and uh, which is often 90 degrees. Compensator is often a quarter wave plate, and uh, p here was the angle of the polarizer. So I mean that's interesting. Now if we let delta be a quarter wave plate, compensator would be a quarter wave plate. So that's 90 degrees, what the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. And so we have the result here and uh, that if the compensator is a quarter wave plate, the orientation of the polarizer has no effect upon the ratios and the amplitudes of the S and P components instant upon the sample. Okay, so what we, what we have said before, we'll say it one more time here, that in the measurement, what we're going to do is adjust the polarizer and analyzer so we can extinguish the beam reflected off the sample. And there are going to be two orientations of the polarizer that will lead to plain polarized light. One is where we exactly cancel out the, the um, delta introduced by the sample. And so uh, delta incident would be minus delta of the sample. And the other one would be the same, ex except we have a 180 degree phase difference. Uh, because remember, um, you get linear polarization if you have zero phase between S and P or if you have 180 degrees between S and P. And if we go up to our e equations up above, then you have the, the tangent of delta for the sample is sine of delta, um, which may be 1 if delta is quarter wave plate, um, tangent 90 degrees minus 2p, the orientation of the polarizer, or the same thing down here except uh, instead of 90 degrees, make it 270 degrees. And so then at extinction, the analyzer is, say, A. And so it's going to differ from the reflected beam by plus or minus 90 degrees because we're going to extinguish it. And so if you go down here and, and, and go through the, the algebra here, you'll find that these are the, uh, the tangent of the psi here is given by, um, well, where uh, A is the analyzer, so tangent minus A, one analyzer, analyzer position divided by tangent of, of the L. Uh, and if, if it turns out that uh, the compensator is indeed a quarter wave plate, then the relationship here between delta and psi, which is what we're trying to measure, would be quite simple here. And it simply comes from the um, 90 degrees minus 2 times the angle of the polarizer, or 270 degrees minus 2 times the angle of the polarizer. And um, psi is given by the, you get from the angle of the analyzer to extinguish. So we can, using this ellipsometer, we can measure delta and psi. And, um, from delta and psi, if you go through a lot of complex ca uh, calculations, you can determine the complex refracti refractive index of the substrate. And if you have thin films, you can measure the thickness and the refractive index of the films. And these equations are very complicated, and I'm not going to spend the time in class to, to go over them. But I'll give you a couple of references here. Uh, by far, 
the best reference is Azam's book on ellipsometry and polarized light. It's, uh, it has uh, everything in it you can think about for uh, ellipsometry, I think. It's really a superb book. The other, um, what I found quite interesting to look at is just the uh, Gertner Scientific, their manufacturer ellipsometer, and they've put out a manual on ellipsometry uh, that is much easier to read than Azam's book, but um, of course doesn't have the detail in it that Azam's book has. Okay. If we go back here, I wanted to, we'd showed a couple of pictures before. Well, if we go back here, I mean, it, it goes right back to the, to the beginning here. Where did I have it down here? I've forgotten. Well, I need help here to find where it is here. Have I gone past it? Right here it is. It's just a ratio. Tangent of that's just a ratio of the P and S components. So if we go back here to our other notes, I had a few pictures of ellipsometers here. And what you always see, I mean, you're always illuminating it at a large angle of incidence, typically something on the order of 60 degrees. And then you are viewing it at the, at the similar angle here. And you have a polarizer on one side and an analyzer on the other side that you rotate. Now, for some ellipsometers, you, you vary the wavelength. You do the measurement at a lot of different wavelengths, especially if you're looking at, at um, uh, complex thin films. Other times, you also you will vary the angle of incidence and angle of reflection. And you can gather more data uh, that way. Now, nowadays, uh, well, let's, I have a couple more here. So in uh, uh, the US, anyway, there are probably a three main manufacturers of ellipsometers. You have Gertner, you have Woolham, and you have Rudolph. And in other countries, there are a lot of, a lot of companies that, that make uh, ellipsometers in, in other parts of the world. But in the US, the Gertner and the Woolham and the Rudolph are the main ones. And uh, these are just some I took off the web. One more here. Nowadays, these are all computerized and, and what used to be very sophisticated calculations. Well, they're still sophisticated, but at least they're, they're much easier to, uh, to perform now. So I, I think I asked this before, but I can't remember the answer. Did, has anyone here used an ellipsometer? A little bit. Tried to. <laughs> Tried to. One here or someplace else? Uh, yeah, Tom Nostra has one. Uh, he's been wanting it to another, uh, I think, right now. But uh, it came with some software that's really <coughs> clunky and awkward and difficult to use. And <laughs> there was no manual or anything, so we never really got to work. But. Uh -huh. No manual? Yeah. yeah, well, makes it more of a challenge, I guess. Anyway, they're, they're pretty powerful. and. Uh, Widely used. Lots of companies that sell them. Why do they have the, uh, two, like, I guess they have the income, incident and receiving and such? Large angles? Large angles. You get more sensitivity. Well, if you think for a second, if I go to extreme, I go to normal incidence, S and P are the same, so I'm not getting anything. And as you increase the angle, um, at least for a ways, the sensitivity turns out the sensitivity increases. And if you go too far, it decreases again. And it, uh, for most materials, it's something in the, uh, a range of 60 degrees is maximum sensitivity. Is that but, an adjustment that you make on the What's that? Is that an adjustment you can make on the In some instruments, it's fixed. And in other ones, it's an adjustment. And in some, uh, you actually do the measurement at several different angles, and you can get additional data. 
And that's really true when you're looking at, if you have complex uh, thin films, you're trying to measure several layers and you're trying to get information about each layer and, and uh, it takes a lot of measurements and a lot of calculations. Go to Azam's book, you'll be, uh, you'll be impressed, but you'll also be very happy that the whole course is not on ellipsometers. But you might take a course from Russell Chipman on ellipsometers. That's, uh, well, the other thing, um, measurement of, of um, uh, birefringence, is uh, looking for uh, strain. And so you could have a sample here that, that has some, uh, it's strained and it will introduce some birefringence. So this is our sample. And so the uh, first thing you might do is to put it between cross polarizers the uh, P and the A here. And uh, often we use a white light source here. And you'll look at the, the colors that you see here. And um, well, uh, you can get at least a, a qualitative feel as to how much birefringence you have. Now often what, um, what people will, will do here, trying to adjust something on my view graph. Um, often people will put in a little sensitive tint plate, which is a, a birefringent crystal that introduces a bias. And so um, it will generally use something that will give you a magenta color here. And then as you have um, strain, the, the colors will change. And um, uh, the eye is very sensitive to changes in colors. And so you can predict or can detect small changes in birefringence. And you can even put in a, um, uh, some type of compensator, such as a Babinet cap compensator, where you can adjust the birefringence. And you can see what you have to do to how much birefringence you have to put in to cancel out the birefringence from here. And from that, determine just how much birefringence you have there. Now, the um, birefringence is expressed in units of generally nanometers per centimeter. So the, the thicker it is, probably the more birefringence you have. So that's normalized to the thickness. So it would be units like nanometers per centimeter thickness. Now, there are other ways of, of um, more precisely measuring just how much birefringence you have. And I'll go back to the other notes for that. And I think it's going to take me a little while to scroll down to where the notes are here. Ah, right there it is. So here's, a, here's one, one of, there are many, many ways of measuring birefringence, but this is one way of doing it here. Um, so here's our sample. And we'll put in a, a circular polarizer. So the light here is circular polarization through the sample. And here we're going to put in an analyzer that we're going to rotate. And we're going to measure the intensity back here. And you probably will um, image this sample out here someplace. Although I, I guess I don't have it in position here right now where it's imaging it. But you add some other optics and image the, the sample out here so you could measure the, the uh, birefringence point by point. And I want to go through here just a real fast um, calculation here as to how much, um, how we would determine how much birefringence we have. And for this, I'm going to use the uh, Stokes vectors and the Mueller matrices. And again, I'm, I'm assuming you had this back in, in 505. And if you're rusty on it, you might go to Hex book and, and uh, check it out a little bit. So we say we have circular polarization here. So that would be our uh, Stokes vector for circular polarization. And uh, if I have a, a linear, horizontal linear polarizer, this would be my Mueller matrix for that. 
And if I had a linear retarder, a retardation delta with a fast axis horizontal, uh, this would be my matrix for that. And um, so what, I mean, what this is then is a retarder, a retardation delta, a delta may vary across the sample. And, but I don't know just what the axis of it is. So I'm going to put this in and rotate it. And so this is my rotation axis. And so if I want to know what the matrix of a retarder or retardation delta having a fast axis and angle theta from the horizontal, I could take my horizontal retarder and sandwich that in between my rotation matrices of plus theta, minus theta. And this thing here that I call RROT then will be the matrix of the retarder, a retardation delta having a fast axis and angle theta. Okay, so now to calculate what I have over here, I'll come down one more line. So I started out with circular polarization. And then I have my sample here. So that's uh, this retarder delta fast axis theta from the horizontal. And then the light goes through this polarizer that is rotating at some speed omega t. So theta for this is um, uh, omega t. And if you go through this multiplication to look at what we have in the output, wherever it is here, there, we, oops, we will have, going through the multiplications here, we get something that goes as 1 minus sine of delta times the sine of 2 theta minus omega t. And so the amplitude of this signal, uh, well, we have a sinusoidal signal that goes, you know, 2 omega t sinusoidal signal. The amplitude of that is given by the sine of the birefringence. So, and the phase of the signal is given by 2 times the angle of the birefringence. So by looking at the amplitude of the signal we get, we can get the amount of birefringence. And by looking at the phase of the signal, we're getting the angle of the birefringence. And so if we have something where the birefringence is varying across the sample, we simply would measure this signal we're getting at the end at many points across the image of the sample. So that's one way of measuring birefringence of a sample. There's, there are many other ways of doing it, but that's one that's kind of convenient and kind of interesting. So any questions on that? Is it a unit for a nanometer per centimeter? Nanometer per centimeter is a common units anyway. How, uh, I mean, it seems like it should be like a radiant per centimeter. No, well, I mean, you you could have something that is a, a phase per centimeter, but here we're saying the optical path difference between the S and P comma components is some amount, which typically they use uh, nanometers for that. Okay. So we'll go back to the slides here. The last topic here is that now sometimes I want to measure the mechanical or thermal properties of the material before I make optics out of it. This is especially true for making of large mirrors. 
because you want to know if I have a thermal gradient across this mirror, how is the, how is the shape of the mirror going to change? Or if I, if I put a load on the mirror, how is the shape going to change? And you want to make sure that the material has the properties that you want. And so one, one technique for this is to, let's say this is our mirror blank. And it could just be a ground surface. We, we're going to do no work on it before we do the test here. Ground surface. We're going to illuminate this with a laser beam. And we're going to make a hologram of the surface. How many of you have made a hologram? Oh, not too many. OK. Um, so we'll make a hologram of this, by, um, which is nothing other than interferogram, really recording that here and um, we could use some type of thermoplastic device or I'll just I'll just use film here so um, we will make a hologram of that now if I after processing the hologram if I illuminate the hologram with the reference beam and look back through here I will see the original mirror blank as I had illuminated it. And at the same time, if I'm, oops, if I'm, what did I do here? At the same time, if I um, illuminate this mirror blank, I'll look in here and I'll see the recorded image of the mirror blank and the actual mirror blank. Now, if some way I deform the surface by either putting a mechanical load on it or putting some temperature uh, variation across it, I will see interference fringes that will tell me precisely how this surface has changed. And uh, so I could measure changes in the surface down in the nanometer range. Now, later as we go through and we talk about phase shifting interferometry, I'm going to show you um, uh, an actual system that we made uh, for uh, doing this type of work. And it was actually made for looking at the back plane of the James Webb Space Telescope. But anyway, we have to go through and learn about phase shifting interferometry before we can really appreciate um, what that other test is. But uh, the basic idea, we just make a hologram, we look at how the uh, we look at the interference fringes we get by interfering the light from the that was recorded in the hologram with the light coming from this surface after we deform it some way. Any questions on that? Okay. Well, I guess that has covered everything I wanted to cover in chapter two. And so we need to go on to chapter three here. I have to find chapter three. Now, before I forget, let's see, I think you have homework due. When, when's your homework due? Thursday. Thursday. After class or at the beginning of class? <laughs> ah, beginning of class. Okay, good. So you have, I think, four homework problems due on. Thursday morning. Okay, so chapter chapter three here. So you've all had courses on aberrations probably, right? You're all experts on aberrations. Well what I'm going to give you here is a little a little review of aberrations. And I mean the idea here is that the rest of the course, what we're going to be doing is measuring optical systems or optical components. And uh, so we're going to be measuring the aberrations. And so we have to make sure we, we understand what the aberrations are before we, before we go measuring them. So many, where did these notes come from? Well, many years ago, I actually worked as an optical engineer. It's hard to believe now, but I actually did when I was a young kid. And as I was doing optical engineering work, and especially optical testing work, I've, I found that there were several 
things about aberrations that I, uh, that I use quite often. And so I began, uh, I used to have a lab book, and I began recording these things in my lab book, the different facts about aberration that I found useful. And I got quite a collection of notes on that. And then when I started to teach out here, I, I decided to put those notes, uh, put those handwritten things in my lab book into a, a chapter on aberrations. And so I wrote that up. And then uh, a few years later, we were editing this book series, Applied Optics and Optical Engineering. And I decided it was time to put these notes in, a, in the book. But I was too busy at the time to actually do that work. And so I got Kathy Kreth, who had been a, a student of mine and, and um, I had worked for me at WICO and then had come back here as a, on the faculty here to uh, take what I was using in class and, and put them into this book chapter in Applied Optics and Optical Engineering. So we're going to go through this chapter. And uh, I don't, it's pretty hard to buy this book anymore. It's out of print unless maybe they do print by demand now you can get it. But anyway, I, I made a copy of the notes so everyone can, can have a copy and follow along. So we have quite a number of topics we're going to talk about here. And we'll, we'll start off here with um, sign conventions. We'll talk about aberration-free image. Go on and talk about spherical wavefronts, defocus, and lateral shift, angular, transverse, and longitudinal aberration. And we'll come down here and spend some time talking about the Seidel aberrations, a little bit on Zernike polynomials, and then relate Zernikes to third order aberrations. Peak to valley in RMS, Strel ratio, and 30 seconds on chromatic aberrations. So maybe not that much time, actually. Just not much. Um, and then plain parallel plates, which have driven me crazy over the years, because you're always putting plain parallel plates into test setups, and they do bad things. Uh, we won't say much on um, aberrations of uh, thin lenses. We'll say a little bit about conics, and later we'll talk more about conics and general A-spheres. And then I'll give some references at the end. So as we go through these notes, I'm not going to derive many things at all. I'm just kind of stating things that you, many of it you've seen before, but maybe you've forgotten it, maybe you haven't, I don't know. Um, but refresh, your, refresh it anyway. Uh, so I'm just going to state uh, many of the equations. And if you want to go to the references, you, you can find derivations for most of the equations here. Um, so we we'll first talk about uh, well the coordinate system. So I'm going to use x, y, z here, uh, where the tangential plane is in the x, z plane, and that's not always the case. And in, in, as you read uh, other references or other books, uh, sometimes it's uh, the y, z plane. But for these notes, I'm going to make it the x, z plane. So right-handed coordinate system. Now, talking about OPD here, we're saying that OPD is positive if the wavefront leads the ideal unaberrated wavefront, like we show here. So that would be positive OPD. And if we think here for a second, then, so here I have two spherical waves. I have this spherical wave here coming to focus there. And then I introduce a positive OPD to bend this more this way, positive OPD. And that's going to cause a shift in the image to the left. And so that's going to, as we say here someplace, um, If we have a positive aberration, we'll get a negative focal shift. So for a positive aberration, the focus will be in front of the Gaussian image plane. So positive OPD will cause a negative image shift. OK. Going along here, if we're testing a mirror, 
And let's say we have a bump on the mirror. If we have a bump on the mirror, then that will be uh, a positive. Uh, well, there will be a bump in the OPD, so that would be a positive OPD. Angles, oh, this is. So we're saying if I go counterclockwise here, this would be a positive angle. And if I say here, I'm going, to, I'm going to use the sign convention here that if this is rho, I'm measuring the angles relative to the x-axis. And so this distance here, so that would be theta. And this distance here would be rho cosine theta. And this distance here would be rho sine theta. And I mean, if you go to books, I mean, not certainly half the people agree with that sign convention, maybe. And the other half would do this. They would measure relative to the y-axis. And so that would be rho cosine theta, and this would be rho sine theta. But as far as these notes are concerned, this is the, what I'm going to use here. Rho cosine theta along the x direction, rho sine theta along the y direction. Um, so we're going to use the polar coordinates for many of the, of the formulas here, Seidel aberrations, and Zernike, Zernike coefficients, and so on. And so just repeating what I said before, is the angles will increase in the counterclockwise, and the zero angle is along the x-axis. And when we're looking at the pupil plane from the image plane, and this is the definition that is used in most interferogram analysis programs and in many of the lens design programs. It's not what's often used in books, but um, it's what's generally used in optical testing, and so that's why I picked that sign convention. Um, how many of you have a copy of Wilford's book? Is that commonly used here or not? No, not anymore. It's a very, very good book on aberration, so. The, uh, at least the second edition is. The first edition is, is filled with typos. And maybe that's a good way to learn um, aberrations, go through it and find all the errors in the book, because essentially every equation is wrong. Uh, he fixed that for the second edition. But anyway, his, his sign convention is not the same as mine, but I'm doing optical testing, so I'm going to do what the optical testing people do. OK. I think that's everything. Showing all that. Aberration free image. I mean, this is more commonly called a diffraction limited image. You know, and when I was 30 years old, I used to get so mad when people would call that, you know, what I call an aberration free image, if they called that a diffraction limited image. Because I thought every image is diffraction limited. I mean, what, whatever aberrations, whatever you have, I mean, it's going to be diffraction limited. And so I began calling this aberration-free image. But I have to say, as I get older, I don't, it doesn't, calling it diffraction limited doesn't bother me so much anymore. So you can call it either one, and I won't, I won't get too upset. So if we have a tilt here, um, you know, say the first, the beam is like here, it's coming to focus there. Now if I introduce a positive OPD, tilting it, the image is actually going to move in the negative direction. So positive OPD here, image is moved down in the negative direction. So wavefront tilt will cause a, an image shift. Now this is one of the many equations I'm not going to derive here, but those you have had 505. Maybe I should ask, how many of you have had 505? Okay. You went through all these diffraction calculations there, or maybe in other courses as well. 
and you know that uh, for an aberration free image, the radiance goes as something or another here times 2j1 of something over something squared. So um, if d is the pupil diameter, and I say alpha here is the angle between the observation point and the center of the refraction pattern. Uh, it's measured from the center of the, of the circular aperture. So that's alpha here. Lambda is the wavelength. Then this Bessel function here would be 2j1 of pi d alpha over lambda divided by pi d alpha over lambda squared. And then there's this factor out in front that we normally forget about and we call it c or something, a constant. But if we write down what it really is, this is e sub a, where e sub a is the irradiance, irradiance being power per unit area, incident upon the aperture, times pi d squared over 4 quantity squared. So if we think here for a second, e sub a times pi d squared over 4, well, that's the power per unit area incident on the aperture. And that would be the area of the aperture. So that's the total power incident on the aperture. So we have that, oops, but then this quantity here, the pi d squared over 4 is actually squared. And then that's divided by the wavelength squared. So this would be power per unit solid angle in the image plane. So here's my pupil here, and I'm looking out in space, and I'm looking, you know, in angular space. And that would be power per unit solid angle. Now, often, instead of writing it in power per unit solid angle, we write it in power per unit area. And so same pupil diameter d. And let's say we're distance l from the exit pupil. The power per unit area, or radiance, and of the diffract in the diffraction pattern is given by, well, still the 2j1 of something uh, over something squared. And now we're going from angle uh, per unit solid angle to per unit area. And so that alpha goes away. And so we go r, which is going to be a distance, divided by lambda l, or r over l. And out in front here, well, this becomes the same, except we're doing per unit area, and so we have to divide by L squared, where L is the distance from the exit pupil to where we're looking at the diffraction pattern. And this R here is the radial distance from the center of the diffraction pattern to the observation point. So I don't, I mean, I don't expect you to memorize these formulas or anything like that, but kind of understand them and, and uh, uh, but I'm never going to ask you to, to memorize them. Now, if I'm talking about a lens, uh, the lens might have an F number associated with it, um, which would be, what, uh, for looking at an infinite object anyway, it would be F over D. Uh, we're looking here at something a distance L away, so we'll write that as L over D. And so we replace L over D up here with F number, and then we have the, this is our result here, that the radiance goes as uh, E sub A pi squared D squared over 16 lambda squared over F number squared, and then our 2J1 of something which is pi r over lambda f number over that pi r over lambda f number. So, I mean, the radiance here is going to be proportional to the radiance falling on our lens. It goes as a square of the diameter of the lens, and it goes as 1 over the f number squared of the lens. 
And we could plot that. If I can move this. And um, so this would be a, a plot here. And um, where along the x-axis, I, I write this in terms of airy disk radii, which is uh, uh, where this first goes to 0. We call that 1. And um, um, so that would be what the diffraction pattern would look like for a uniformly illuminated circular aperture. Now, so we call that diffraction pattern, you've seen that many times, the airy disk. And we're saying the distance between the two zero intensity regions on each side of the central maximum is what we call the airy disk diameter. So minus one to one here would be the airy disk diameter. And if we go back to our equation and look at how far out that is, this airy disk diameter, well, this coming out here is what, 1.22 lambda f number? Going back, ooh, whatever happened to our equation? Going back to where that goes to zero, this would be 1.22 lambda f number. And so the airy disk diameter is 2.44 lambda f number. And the wavelength of visible light is something like a half a micron. And when I don't have my calculator here and I multiply 0 0.5 times 2.44, I get 1. And so the, the airy disk diameter um, is on the order of what the F number in microns. Okay. So that's about the F number in microns. So if I have a F5 lens bringing the light to focus, aberration free, this area disk diameter is about 5 microns. Okay. Any questions at that? Now, it's kind of interesting to uh, look at the distribution of energy in the diffraction pattern. And I guess I have a table, before I get to that equation, I have a table down here someplace that shows that. So it, it turns out that within this, if we have no aberration, Within the central maximum, we have nearly 84% of the light. Okay. And if I go out to one more ring, I pick up another 7%. And another ring would pick up almost 3% and so on. There aren't many numbers that you should remember, but maybe 84% within a central max that comes up often enough that maybe you want to remember that. And what will happen if we introduce aberration is that we, we probably won't change the location of that, of that uh, it won't change the diameter of the central max here very much. But what we will change a lot is how much light is within the central max. And as we put in aberration, we'll see that we're going to spread out the light from the central max. So about 84% is in that. Now, kind of interesting that we can calculate here, and I, I show it in the notes, so I'm not going to do it in class, but we can calculate what fraction of the light is within different radii. So let's say I want to calculate the fraction of the total energy contained within a circle radius r, <clears throat> and we're doing this for the case of no aberration. It will turn out, if you look at the derivation in the notes, that the fraction of encircled energy goes as 1 minus j naught squared of pi r, r being the, the circle radius that we're looking at, divided by lambda f number minus j1 squared of pi r over lambda f number. So what 
what assumptions are we making in doing this calculation? How many, how many of you have derived this? Oh, I expect at least half the hands to go up. Okay. Well, it turns out this is an exact equation. There are no, no approximations being made here. This is an exact equation. And I do, I'm not going to go through it in class, but I do, right here, we do have the, the derivation for it. And I always thought that was kind of kind of cool that something that, I don't know, seemed pretty complicated, it, it turns out to be uh, an exact equation here. Okay, now let's say, let's say we have a central obscuration. I mean, often optical systems have a, you know, have a mirror and you have a hole in the middle of the mirror. So a central obscuration. And let's say that epsilon here is the ratio of the diameter of the central obscuration to the mirror diameter. And let's say that the, the mirror is uniformly illuminated. <coughs> then it will turn out <coughs> that the power per unit solid angle in our diffraction pattern goes as, well, we still have the same mess out in front E sub A, pi D squared over 4, quantity squared, divided by lambda squared. But inside, and inside here we have the 2J1, uh, 1.22 pi R over 1.22 pi R, and then we're subtracting something that goes as epsilon squared times this quantity right here. So R in this expression is units of area disk radius for the unobstructed aperture of equal diameter. Okay. And so uh, this is our expression for our diffraction pattern, our radiance uh, per unit solid angle uh, in our diffraction pattern with this central obscuration. And if we come down here, uh, skip past our derivation here that everyone's going to look at today, right? Before you go to bed tonight, you'll go through that. So when I ask you next class, how many of you have gone through that derivation? Every hand will go up. Oh, I didn't, I should have shown this before. This was just the uh, encircled energy um, for the um, aberration-free system. So if we go back to our expression here for our peak intensity of the diffraction pattern, um, it will go as 1 minus epsilon squared quantity squared. And if we look here at, um, if beta is the distance of the first zero in units of area disk radius, let's go back to our equation we had up above. I don't want to scroll to it. <clears throat> this would be our expression here that would give you um, beta here as a, as a function of epsilon. And so if we look here at the distance to the first zero as a function of obscuration ratio, we see that as the obscuration ratio increases, the distance to the first zero decreases. And so I hate to actually use the whiteboard here, but I think I will. So if we if we think here for a second, see if I can see that, you know, we have some diffraction pattern that goes like this, you know, and and first zero. Now if I put in a central obscuration, I mean this says that the first zero moves in. And does that make sense? So I can make the central core smaller by putting a central obscuration in. So in, in calculating this diffraction pattern here in the presence of a central obscuration, um, what principle would I, would I use? What is it? Babinet, right. So we have a, 
you know, circular aperture, and then we have a central obscuration here. And so we would say that diffraction pattern is due to the diffraction pattern of the whole thing here, the amplitude produced by the whole thing, minus, from Babinet's principle, minus what came from this portion in here. So if I think here for a second, this might be the amplitude produced by the whole thing. The amplitude produced by the part in the middle is, well, it's much lower because it's smaller. And furthermore, since it's smaller, it's going to be spread out more. And so I don't know what it looks like, but it looks maybe something like this. And so what we have is this minus this. And so sure enough, it did bring our first zero in. So that is simply what this figure eight is showing here, is that as I put a central obscuration, I will move this first zero in. And the larger the central obscuration, the more that I will move it in. So that sounds pretty good. I can make the central core smaller by putting in central obscuration. But what's the bad thing I do? Yeah, I'm, I'm now putting a lot of light outside. And so while the first zero has moved in, I really have moved a lot of light out of the central core. OK. <clears throat> and uh, figure nine here then shows the fraction of the encircled energy uh, for different obscuration ratios. And let me go back here and look at one. Well, I'm not saying anything about spokes. I didn't put. A, I don't have spiders in the system. I just have a hole in the middle. Spiders are another problem. It's just I just put a hole in the middle of the mirror. So I wanted to check here the the figure we have down here. The curves are normalized. So for each case, the total energy is the same for what's transmitted through the aperture. But if you look down here, as I increase the central obscuration, you know, more and more of the light's going way out to outer rings. OK, any other questions on that? OK, so central obscuration and central zero moves in, but the light moves out. Um, the other thing, uh, more and more, when you know we're doing metrology, we we use a laser beam that has a Gaussian intensity distribution. So I'm kind of worried about that. So I put some words in here about that. And so if a lens of diameter d and obscuration ratio epsilon is illuminated um, uh, uh, so we have a collimated Gaussian beam of total power p. The radiance of the diffraction pattern is given by this mess right here. So here we have the diffraction pattern up here. And uh, I guess we're, we're calculating the uh, diffraction pattern using a, uh, since it's rotationally symmetric, we use the Hankel transform. And so this would be our irradiance as a, a function of, of uh, distance from the axis. And just to compare that, just refresh your memory again, if we, if we had a uniform beam, uh, this would be our expression here, again, using the Hankel transform to calculate diffraction pattern. So the difference being the Gaussian distribution here. And we can go through some calculations here and, and um, uh, calculate the diffraction pattern of circular aperture for different Gaussian widths. And this is just a, a plot of that. And I don't know, I put, I, somehow I really got involved in this at some point in my life and looked at it in more detail. And this is just the ratio of the Gaussian uniform peak uh, radiances uh, versus uh, 
the Gaussian width. Probably not a, not a too important uh, diagram here. Okay. So that was talking about what a perfect uh, aberration free system, uh, what type of diffraction pattern do we get for that? Uh, what's your uh, radiance as a function of position? Now, I mean, eventually we're going to work our way up to aberrations. But the next thing is we, we still have a spherical wavefront, but I'm going to have a little lateral shift or a little defocus. And what happens now? So um, I'm, I, I still have perfect optics. And I'm getting a spherical wave coming out of the optics. And let's say that the spherical wave comes to focus here at a distance r away. So this is a radius of curvature of r. And so the um, our exit pupil here has coordinates x and y. And as I said, it's coming to focus here at distance r away. And so I can write that x squared plus y squared plus, this is z here, plus z minus r squared is equal to r squared. Okay. So that's just the equation of our spherical wave. And I'm assuming here that x and y are small compared to r. So I'm going to end up with large f numbers um, for the time being anyway. And um, I want to know what is z here as a function of x and y. So I mean, this is our equation. And I want to solve this equation for z. And I'm going to do this once. You know, I know you have all used this lots of times in calculations. But I want to write it up here once, because this final result that we get down here, that z is x squared plus y squared over 2r, is something we're going to use a million times this semester. So we have x squared plus y squared plus z minus r squared is equal to r squared. Solve that for z. So what do we normally do? Well, we just x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus 2rz plus r squared is equal to r squared. So the r squareds cancel. Now we're assuming that x and y are small compared to r. And so what's the next thing we normally do? What? I can't hear you, but you're probably right. This Taylor expansion. This Taylor expansion. Well, what I'm going to do here, well, I'm, I'm going to say that z is so small that z squared goes to 0. I can neglect it. We're going to have a small sag here. And so now I can solve for z, that z is simply x squared plus y squared over 2r. And if there's one equation you're going to see, well, you're going to have two beam interference equation you're going to see many times this semester. But you're also going to see this many times. So if I have a spherical wave, I will approximate the spherical wave as x squared plus y squared over 2r. And so this is really making what a, a parabolic approximation of the spherical wave. And so a wavefront distribution of x squared plus y squared over 2r in the exit pupil represents a spherical wave converging to a point a distance r away. Okay. So spherical wave, OPD, wavefront, x squared plus y squared over 2r. Dream about that tonight. Okay. I mean, and you've, you've, you've done that when you did diffraction calculations. You've, you've done that many times in your life of making just a, a parabolic approximation to a spherical wave. And we'll do it a million times this semester. So. 
let's say here that we have, you know, the, the um, perfect beam is coming to focus some distance our way. But uh, often in optical testing, we want to find the effect of a distribution in a plane other than the paraxial image plane. And so like in figure 13 here, we're showing a situation where the observation plane is R from the exit pupil, but the wavefront, the so observation plane is here, but the wavefront from the pupil has a radius of curvature of R plus epsilon sub z. So what wavefront aberration does that correspond to? Well, so w of x and y is x squared plus y squared over 2 r plus epsilon sub z. So I can simply rewrite that as x squared plus y squared over 2 r times 1 plus epsilon sub z over r. So we made the parabolic approximation here, and then this follows directly from that. And I'm assuming that our image shift here is small. Epsilon z is small. And so 1 over 1 plus epsilon sub z over r, I can write as just 1 minus epsilon sub z over r. And so our wavefront here is x squared plus y squared over 2r minus, this is our shift term here, minus epsilon sub z x squared plus y squared over 2r squared. Okay. So we can say here that a defocus term, which goes as a plus a times x squared plus y squared, and if we add that to our spherical wave of radius r, this will give us a focal shift given by, just plugging into here, minus 2r squared times a. So, first off, the sign convention, if we think here for a second, you know, if this is a, a positive, oops, well, maybe it'll come right down here. If this is a positive wavefront aberration, that means that epsilon sub z is negative. So a positive OPD will shift us towards the exit pupil. A negative OPD will shift us away from away from the exit pupil here. Okay. So many times in, in optical testing as we go through here, interferometry, we're going to introduce a defocus term. And that defocus term is simply an a times an x squared plus y squared. And, you know, that could calculate just how far the shift is. And if the focus term is positive, then the shift is towards, the focus shift is towards the exit pupil. Um, okay. Any questions on that? Because, I mean, this is something we're going to do a million mm -hmm. times. Oh, uh, sometimes we'll write this in a different way here. Um, we'll say let u be the maximum half angle, half cone angle of the converging beam, and say the f number is, well, f number here. And so we can go back to our expression here, and we can write that as d focus is minus one half epsilon sub z sine squared of u, which is minus one half epsilon sub z times the numerical aperture squared, which is minus epsilon sub z over 8 f number squared. And I don't, again, I don't expect you to remember this equation, but it's kind of useful to remember that it, it goes as 1 over f number squared. Okay. And this is kind of interesting here. Um, the Rayleigh criterion uh, is that uh, 
and OPD due to the focus at the edge of the pupil is a quarter wave. That's so the delta W D focus is plus or minus a quarter wave. So at the edge of the pupil, the OPD is a quarter wave. And so we simply set that equal to this quantity here. And we solve for epsilon sub z. And we get that that's plus or minus 2 lambda f number squared. So for a quarter way of, def of defocus, the shift in the image is plus or minus 2 lambda f number squared. Lambda, visible light, half micron or so. Use a half micron because that works out really nice. Two times a half is one. And so it's plus or minus the f number squared in microns. So if we have an f10 lens for a quarter wave of defocus, it's a shift in the image of plus or minus 100 microns. f5, plus or minus 25 microns. F1, well, we made some approximations here that aren't so valid when we get to F1, but F5, F10, we can use that pretty nicely. Okay. So if, if you're allowed a quarter wave of defocus, you're allowed a focal shift of plus or minus F number squared. And I'll drink to that. Any questions there? So this is, this is actually very handy to remember. Sometimes you can impress your boss by spitting this out. Oh, it must be 49 microns. Yeah. How, did he, how did that young person ever figure that out? Okay. I'll guarantee you'll get a chance to use that once or twice in your life at least. I've, I have anyway. Um, now what I want to do is not a longitudinal shift, but I want to do a lateral shift. And so I can write this as, um, uh, I, I'm going to do a lateral shift in the x direction. So I can write the spherical wavefront in the exit pupil as y squared plus x minus epsilon sub x. So that's my shift in the x direction. Quantity squared plus z minus r squared is equal to r squared. And if you go through, I mean, the same, same thing we did here. I'll let you do that. You should do it. That you'll find out then that the wave front now, well, we have this spherical wave, x squared plus y squared over 2r. But when I do this expansion here, and so again, you know, just like before, I'm going to let the z squared go to 0. And I'm going to let uh, epsilon sub x squared go to 0. And we'll have that the wave front then is x squared plus y squared over 2r minus x epsilon sub x over r. So that represents a spherical wave, x squared plus y squared, and a lateral shift, or tilt, I'm going to call it tilt, of x times something or another. In this case, epsilon sub x over r. Okay. So in general, um, this right here could represent a wave front leaving the exit pupil. We have a spherical wave. We have a shift in the image position here. So we have an x squared plus y squared defocus. We call that defocus. We have terms linear in x and y. So these are tilts. Spherical wave, defocus, tilt. Okay. Any questions?
Okay, so what we'll do next class, we'll, um, there's a note here saying that I want to see the light distribution near focus. So we're going to go through some, look at some diffraction patterns, look at what the light looks like as we go through focus. Actually kind of neat calculations. And then we'll come back here and talk about angular transverse and longitudinal aberration. And you, at the beginning of class, you will hand in homework. Between now and Thursday, you'll try to figure out who we're going to beat in football on Saturday. <laughs> and uh, maybe that's it. So I'll see you.